On Tuesday the 4th of August 1987, in Augusta, Maine, Katie Harrison was born. Eventually she would become placed in the legal custody of the state of Maine. That day would not come for five years, one month and nine days. I'm going to tell you the story of Katie and I'm going to say now this could be the best thing uh, series I ever do on this channel because it's a story from a book by the renowned clinical psychologist Daniel Hughes called Building the Bonds of Attachment and this may be dramatic, it may be a statement I come to revise but I finished reading the book last week and right now it feels like the best book I've ever read. It's an educational case study, yes, which means I expected an interesting but slightly heavy read, um, and I think it is kind of that, but it's also a story I got more emotionally invested in than any story I've ever read, or TV series I've ever watched, or anything really. I am just so excited to share this with you. However, there are very important disclaimers before we begin. The first one being I've tossed and turned for the last week or so over the copyright rules of making this series because you obviously can't just read a book out. No, um, fair use rules seem a little less clear with books for which I've tried to seek advice from various people, emailed YouTube's personal support, which was useless by the way. Um, I emailed Daniel Hughes himself asking for his permission but he hasn't responded and I, I, I just feel too passionate to not share this with you, so I'm going to make this series, but it is obviously going to be fair use, which means I'll only quote short extracts where it's necessary, and they'll come up on screen as quotes, however it's likely I'll still have reworded some of the extracts a bit to condense things a little more. Um, so there's that. Around the quotes, I'll summarise the important parts of the story, or explain things in my own words, add my own thoughts, all that typical rambling stuff I usually do. So there'll be all of that. Um, and I won't explain everything from the book as well, obviously. I'll just touch on specific things I want to talk about. But yeah, I will quote passages where it's important not just to explain things, but also hopefully to convey the emotion of this story and to get you as emotionally invested as I was. And um, the second important disclaimer is that Katie Harrison isn't a real person, however the events we get in this story will be 100% realistic and based on experiences with real children very much like Katie Harrison. Um, chances are, like I did, you completely forget this is fictional and this episode of the series, possibly the next one or two as well, you won't get emotionally invested in just yet, or at least I didn't because uh, this is a realistic story, it begins quite bleak as you'd expect and it's not a little way into the book before we start to see the hope and then start to feel the incredible sweetness that occurs in this story so um, this video could be a bit bleak but then a lot of mine kind of are aren't they? <laughs> um, I'm going to start by explaining Katie to you though and summarising the first five years of Katie's life which we do actually get an in-depth chapter on in the book but um, it's quite long and quite emotionally distressing and YouTube, probably not YouTube friendly, so I'll just summarise the important points as briefly as I can. Katie was born in 1987, Augusta, Maine. Her mum, Sally, was 19 at the time and her dad, Mike, was 23. They'd been together for about 18 months on and off with lots of fights and separations. Sally's hope was that having a baby might, for one, impress her parents and elder sisters to who she always felt she was never good enough to earn approval from, but also that it would settle Mike down and motivate him to work harder and drink less, to which it had the opposite effect really, and Sally found herself largely alone, struggling with this baby, struggling with Mike's drunken, sometimes violent behaviour, and struggling with the growing doubt that maybe the rest of her family were always write about her, that she's never good enough at anything, maybe she's not a good mother, and this baby who always seems to cry, that Sally can't quite seem to understand, suddenly that became less a symbol for hope and more a symbol of her failure to be an adequate mother. And at that point she became burdened with this uncomfortable feeling of resentment for her baby. 
Katie was left habitually cold through the winter with a blanket that didn't suffice. She was washed and had her nappy changed infrequently. She often went hungry. When she cried, she was sometimes answered, other times ignored. If she cried too much, Mike would lose his temper and hit her. There is one instance even where Sally throws Katie onto the bed and she bounces off the mattress and breaks her leg. The neglect is the thing I want to highlight here though. Neglect that grew following this injury actually because Sally didn't want the same horrifying guilt of ever hurting her child again so she buried her feelings of resentment even deeper and just became very deadened, very numb towards her child. Where even if she would feed and bathe her there was no emotional connection, no real interaction so much as just going through the motions. Neglect isn't as shocking to us as other forms of abuse, so I don't think we often take in just how profound its effects can be, and the neglect in this story is profound and led to a state in which this baby just stopped crying altogether, instead largely shutting down. What, what Katie truly lacked was aff affection, and when it's through the way our carers interact with us at that early age that we learn our concept of self, to be denied a lot of that interaction is hugely damaging emotionally and developmentally to a child. Over those first few years Katie began to believe that she must be a bad person, but that her parents must also be bad people who hated her. We're left with a child who almost finds pleasure in angering or upsetting her parents because that seems to be the only real emotional response she can elicit from them, which is better than none, and is also a way to try and take control in a world where things feel terrifying without it. So the three, four, five-year-old Katie would anger her parents, they would punish her, and then she would seek revenge on them for being mean to her, and a cycle appeared that spiralled completely out of control until one instance where Mike horrifically beat and humiliated Katie whilst one of his friends was present who immediately alerted the police. Mike was arrested and Katie was taken into care. As you can imagine, the greater detail that chapter is actually told in is quite a distressing read and quite a distressing beginning to the book, but important context um, for everything that will follow. So, Katie was moved to the foster home of Ruth and Ray Daly, who also have a three-year-old son named Dustin. And Katie was given a play therapist as well called Jan Temple, and it's then largely from the perspective of her children's services caseworker Stephen Fields that the story is told. So, to begin, things look fairly optimistic in her new home. Um, <laughs> Stephen went to meet them for the first time. How are things going with Katie? asked Stephen. She's quite a handful so far. We're hoping that she'll settle in as she gets used to living here. She's a strong-willed kid. She's also plenty rough and dusting, my three-year-old. I've got to watch her a lot. Just then, Katie came running to Stephen, yelling, McDonald's! Stephen laughed and immediately liked this lively and direct child. Which is what we get, someone who seems quite bossy, but in a fairly sweet way. Stephen had agreed to take her to McDonald's so they could talk and get to know each other, and we then get... She did not hesitate to tell him what she wanted to eat, where she wanted to sit, when she wanted to play in the play area, and when she wanted her apple pie. He was only too eager to please her. She was so appreciative and enjoyable. You would find it sweet, and what we'll get throughout the early chapters of the book is a bit of a pattern of her being quite sweet when she first meets people, but also, as we see hints of already, an eagerness to control and focus more on seeking materialistic things rather than people's affection or presence. Katie was denied all affection growing up, it's not something she'll expect or even seek, and equally she's someone who very much had to fend for herself as kind of a matter of survival, so she won't trust or believe anyone will meet her needs, so she'll unconsciously employ an array of different behaviour designed to exact what she needs, or what she thinks she needs. Um, and obviously one method of that is charm. But Katie is 
a very difficult child to look after, and I'll, I'll just give you Ruth's account after a few months. It seems like every day there's something I have to get on at her about. Yesterday she threw Dustin's little bike into the pig pen and we didn't find it until this morning. The day before she stuffed up the toilet with some washcloths, and a few days before she stole my bracelet that Ray had given me for Christmas. We still haven't found it, and those are just the obvious things she's done. I tell her not to do something and she listens fine, but does it anyway. When I catch her, she lies about it, even though I'm right there when she does it. If I tell her to stop doing something she wants to do, she'll swear and try to hit me, and when she gets mad at someone, that's when she'll find a way to pay them back. She was mad at Dustin for telling on her, and two hours later his tape recorder was broken. Nothing seems to work. You can imagine day after day of this sort of stuff would put an incredible strain on you, regardless of how experienced the foster mother Ruth might be. Jan Temple's advice to Ruth is essentially patience and maintaining belief. Catch her being good and let her know how pleased you are. Pick your battles. Which is solid advice, ordinarily. Um, picking battles and showing delight for when they do good and hopefully building up a level of rapport and connection underneath so that it isn't just fighting all the time. The thing is... Katie is someone who suffered a great deal of neglect at the most crucial years of her life. She's not really someone capable of attachments or any level of trust or rapport to manage these disagreements with her foster parent upon. Um, it's hard to work with her through the conflicts if you don't actually have a connection, and Ruth even goes on to say after several months, I'm not sure what I mean to her. If she left tomorrow, I don't think she'd give me or anyone else in the family another thought. And yeah, Katie probably wouldn't. How could she dare trust anyone enough to actually let them mean something to her? There's an interesting moment where Stephen tries talking to Katie about her behaviour again and she exclaims, Ruth isn't fair to me. She's always yelling at me. She's mean. Which will also be a bit of a pattern. Whenever anybody doesn't let Katie do anything, it's always because they're mean. Even if it's stopping her to do something for her own benefit, she won't interpret it that way, and this idea of people being mean is something we'll come back to a lot in later chapters, so I won't mention it too much now. The point is both Ruth and Steven start to feel at a loss for how to help Katie. But why would she scratch the paint on the minister's car when he came back one afternoon for a visit? Why would she destroy her own mattress with a fork? Why take dirt and put it in the toaster? Katie seemed to like Aladdin, so why did she put the DVD in five inches of water in the sink? They seek out a behavioural specialist for help whose advice was to design a reward system for Katie so she can experience success instead of failure all the time, which is a good motivation because this is a child who spent most of her life being shamed or punished or feeling worthless inside. If I can make a tangent here, experiencing shame is a healthy and necessary part of development for a child. Dan Hughes talks about this quite extensively, um, it will come back again. Those times your parents tell you no over something um, is an uncomfortable experience. I can remember being very little and running by some ice, I think, and being shouted to stop, not out of anger, but fear that I was about to slip and hurt myself, but there was this strong feeling of shame about being shouted at. My parents are angry because I did wrong, our relationship is ruined, they don't love me anymore, is the sort of experience. Um, and it's an important part of our development to manage that feeling of shame and learn no, it, it doesn't ruin our relationship. My parents do still love me. They hopefully love me unconditionally. Um, ideally, after moments of shame, parents quickly seek to show love and care again to repair that damage the child feels so that they learn it is okay. Even if you do wrong, it's okay. The experience of shame then doesn't destroy your sense of self-worth. It actually helps you to develop a secure attachment to the people you love and for the shame to develop into guilt and empathy. But what if the experiences of shame are much more intense? And what if your parents don't seek to repair the relationship after? What if shame becomes this permanent, consuming experience in your life as a kid? You end up with a child like Katie. 
so defeated by her shame to give up in the idea of ever being good, to just feel bad and worthless. And then, rather than seeking approval, as most children naturally do, um, I mean, I don't much like reward systems anyway, but they would work for most children because most children would seek the approval of showing their parents they can do well at this system. Katie does not seek such approval because she feels she is bad and that's the end of it. She's bad, her parents were bad, Ruth is mean and I'll seek revenge rather than approval. The other reason I personally don't tend to like reward systems is that they sort of go against the idea of unconditional love and teach that you get praise and love only when you behave as we wish you to behave. Um, you know, there's arguably something slightly manipulative to it, or there could be, depending on how it's enforced. Which would of course fit Katie's view of things. She doesn't believe anyone would show her affection, it must be manipulation, so I'll manipulate back, sort of thing. So yeah, they come up with this reward system where Katie earns these plastic coins she can then cash in for gifts or treats or whatever, but she very cleverly learns to exploit it. She seemed to take some pleasure in the fact that she had discovered how to earn rewards while at the same time maintain many of her previous problem behaviours. Yesterday she hit Dustin. Ten minutes later she gave me five coins to watch a video. She had a smile that seemed to be saying, ha ha, you have to let me watch a video even though I did hit Dustin. If she wants something a lot, she'll follow the program perfectly. As soon as she gets it, she'll be as aggressive and oppositional as ever. Or, if for some reason she doesn't particularly want any rewards, she'll do whatever she wants that day and try not to follow the plan at all. Suddenly, this system becomes more of a tangle than things were before. Um, I realise this first video probably feels a bit of a rushed introduction to the series, but I'm now going to jump forwards to the 17th of June, where we get mention of Katie playing very nicely in the garden with Dustin, making him laugh. Katie looked at Ruth, seemingly for approval that she was playing so nicely. Ruth smiled and yelled that she'd get them each a popsicle for playing so well. As Ruth opened the freezer, she heard a scream. She rushed to the window to see Dustin on the ground with Katie standing over him. In horror, Ruth watched Katie pull back her foot and kick Dustin hard in the head. She ran out, calling Katie off and tending to the crying Dustin. Katie was watching her from a distance with a smile that Ruth had never seen before. Katie seemed excited and pleased, not frightened or angry, but happy. Ruth took Dustin inside to tend to him. Katie then came in and demanded her popsicle. No, not after what you did to Dustin, say you're sorry. I hate you, said Katie. I'm not sorry, I'm glad I hurt him, I hate you. And Katie runs off and she throws rocks at the ponies in the pasture. And Ruth hits her breaking point. And understandable breaking point, her three year old child has just been kicked hard in the head and Katie smiled about it. Why did she smile? Um, well, I think there's a lot to unpack there that will get drawn out more later into the story, but for now I will say we know Katie is someone who has not yet developed any empathy because her experiences of shame were overwhelming enough to have blocked all sense of guilt. We've got a child here who's both constantly seeking to reaffirm that narrative she's been told all her life, that she's a bad child who deserves no love whilst also defending herself from the extreme sense of shame and worthlessness that doing something like kicking an innocent child in the head would elicit by instead interpreting that it's Ruth who's the mean one. I didn't do wrong, she's mean because she promised me a popsicle and then betrayed me and apparently I wasn't allowed one. Ruth's being mean just like Sally and Mike were. Also I think the line between being very afraid and very excited and triumphant about a thing is very very thin but as I say we'll draw out more later down the line when there's further examples in the story that demonstrate things a lot better. This is just the introduction video that shows us Katie's general behaviour and what would normally help most children might not apply for someone in Katie's circumstances. I suspect most of you watching this right now don't like Katie at all yet. <laughs> I wouldn't blame you. Um, I think part of the magic of this book will be how that does change. The book's tagline is awakening love in deeply traumatised children. 
awakening love in those who don't have any belief or expectation of love. If we were to forget psychology altogether for a moment um, and were to just dumb everything down, how would you imagine you help teach someone to find love? By giving them love. Um, that's a very scary thing to a child who's never experienced it before. Arguably you could say Katie's behaviour works to make herself unlovable, but she's not unlovable. And if you can express genuine affection for someone who doesn't believe in it, and trust me, you will feel genuine affection for Katie before the end of this book, it will awake your own love as much as hers. Um, then that can make all the difference. Obviously that's not the only thing, and it's not an easy thing to do at all, but it's a nice thread to run through the core of this entire book. Awakening love by offering love. I fully expect, despite the fact I think this series will be one of the most wonderful things I could possibly do on this channel, that it won't be a popular series. <laughs> it's not a famous film or anything, is it? Um, it'll probably be very niche and Regularly making less popular videos like these ones teaches the YouTube algorithm my channel isn't one worth recommending. So if you enjoyed this at all, please help combat that algorithm dead zone by liking this video and commenting your thoughts. Um, I don't often ask this, but I know starting this series is going to harm my channel's growth quite a bit and I want to make it anyway because I care too much. Um, I just feel really passionate about this book and I want to share it with you. Maybe that's stupid of me, but so what? Like and comment if you enjoyed it, share whatever thoughts. Very much look forward to how this story will progress as the series advances and hopefully see you next time. And a special thank you goes to David Kling, Darren Burdock Latter, Kestrel, Biden Bog the Streak, Tommy Steamrod, Samara Salsi, Sharikov2814, and Joshua C. Follier. Thank you.